Hey guys, Kenna here. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the language of science. Now some of you might already kind of know what this is, and so I'll, I'll cry and keep this one kind of brief. But I want you to go ahead and take away some key pieces about our understanding of how we communicate in science and why the language of science is a little bit more universal than our general speaking dialects. Okay. Um, we are going to be using, showing you the different units today that are the, what we consider the base units. And so you'll want to pay close attention to this because all other units are some combination of what we're going to go ahead and show you today. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Here are our essential questions. Number one, what is the language of science? Okay, and then it wants you to think about whether this language that we use in science is qualitative or quantitative or some combination of both. The first term is going to rely heavily on measurements of distance and time. And what are the basic units for these two measurements and how do we use them? Number three, what are the parts of the scientific experiment? and give an example of how you would set up a controlled experiment. And lastly, what is dimensional analysis? Uh, or you might have known it as factor canceling or unit labeling or something along those lines, where we go ahead and make sure we identify the correct units. This is something I'm going to go over again and again and again. You need to show your units. You need to follow your units through all of your math steps. Not just, oh, I get from here to here, and these are the units I'm supposed to have at the end. This is something I'm going to be constantly harping on, is to make sure that you are doing your unit canceling to make sure that you have the correct equation to establish the correct units at the end of your equation. Now, Lord Byron, the first bear, uh, Lord <laughs> William Thompson, the first Baron of Kelvin, or Lord Kelvin is how he's better known, once said this. When you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you actually know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely, in your thoughts, advanced to the state of science. So one of the things we talk about is that the language of science is primarily based around mathematics. And we will be doing a lot of math in this course. And so you want to make sure that your math skills are up to par. Okay. When the ideas of science are expressed in mathematical terms, there's less room for argument. There's less room for misunderstanding. What one person puts down in math, somebody else with the same intelligence in terms of understanding math can go ahead and evaluate the correctness of their equation. The equations of science provide you know, expressions about relationships, because really when we go ahead and study physics, we're looking at the relationship between different bodies, how they interact in terms of their forces, their charges, these types of things. And so it's important to be able to put those into mathematical relationships, but then, because then we can go ahead and evaluate them numerically. The methods of mathematics and experimentation have led to enormous successes in science and a lot of our greatest advances in everything from uh, electronics to wireless communications. These things have relied a lot on math to go ahead and predict them. In, in fact, even our understanding of the universe that we live in in cosmology is largely based in mathematical prediction. So I want you to kind of think of physics equations as guides, okay? If you can understand the impact of one variable on a different variable, then you will have a better understanding of how those two variables are related to each other. And just in a offhanded kind of way, you can use your understanding developed from those equations to understand what's gonna happen if you do one thing to a particular variable and how that's gonna play out with respect to other variables. Now, we're gonna introduce you to the base units here in a second, but it's important that you remember from your physical science days, the SI system of units and the prefixes that go along with this. One of the reasons that we really love the metric system and use that for our SI units is because it's very easy to do conversions. They're all based on multiples of 10. 
Okay, so you can just move a decimal one way or the other and convert units from one to another. It's not like inches into feet where it's 12 or feet into yards, which is three and yards into miles, which probably most of you don't even know what to do with. Okay, we'll work on that. That's one of the things I hope you'll pick up your packet for today. So we go from mega to kilo, hecto, deca, deci, centi, milli, and micro. The ones you're probably most familiar with are centi, milli, and kilo, as along with the base unit that we'll talk about here in a second. A centimeter is one hundredth of a meter. Okay, a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter. A kilometer is a thousand times bigger than a meter. So we need to understand these basic relationships. And I'm going to expect you guys to be able to do these types of conversions if we go ahead and ask you to. So if you need assistance with this, please reach out to me and we can go over these common metric prefixes again. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our base units depending on the type of measurement. We'll start out with length as this is probably the one that we will use the most in this initial term. Uh, that along with time, which we'll get to a little later. Length is the distance from one point to another point. And the base unit that we go ahead and utilize here is the meter. The standard tool that we use is going to be some form of the metric ruler, measuring tape, et cetera. Uh, there are things more accurate. You can think of things like calipers. You can think about digital measurements. Uh, they're still going to have some amount of error. And we'll talk more about error as we go ahead and continue on. The next is volume. Volume is the amount of space the substance occupies and the base unit that we have here is the liter. Uh, tools for metric ruler for regular solids, you can go ahead and calculate length times width times height. There are all sorts of wonderful math equations to do the volume of a cylinder, et cetera. Or you can go ahead and use a graduated cylinder and do a submersion test for the solid if possible, or to just go ahead and pour the liquid into the graduated cylinder if you're measuring liquids. So that's length and volume. Now let's look at mass and weight. Now I put these two together for a very specific reason. A lot of people use these terms interchangeably. They are not interchangeable. Okay? Mass is a measure of how much substance or matter is in a, a material. Uh, and this base unit is the kilogram. The tool that we use to go ahead and quantify this is the balance, not the scale. And so they are not quite the same thing. When we look at a weight, weight is a measure of how much gravity is acting upon an object. This is why if you go to the moon, we'll talk more about this when we get to gravity, your weight changes, your mass does not. The same amount of matter is inside you, but how much force in terms of gravity is on that weight changes. And the unit for weight is the Newton. Okay, and We'll talk more about what a Newton is once we get into forces in motion in our next unit. Typical tool here is a scale. Your bathroom scale runs on weight. Uh, we just use pounds instead of Newtons. Okay. Next is time and temperature. Time is how long an event takes place. And we'll talk about how some of that is relative in terms of Einsteinian relativity, but the unit that we use is the second and the tool that we use is the clock or stopwatch. And so it's really beneficial if you have your, a stopwatch on your cell phone or some other stopwatch or even a wristwatch, something that you can use to go ahead and measure time. As we go through our labs here, it'll be beneficial for you to have a time measuring device that is fairly reliable. Okay, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. And we'll use that along with length as our primary measures for most of this first term. Next one is temperature. This is a measure of the amount of kinetic energy a substance has. I know we like to say it's a measure of heat, but you have to be careful with what you mean by heat. We'll talk more about this next term. Uh, and the SI unit for temperature is the Kelvin. K. So it's not Celsius, it's not Fahrenheit, it's Kelvin. And we'll talk more about that again next term when we get to it. Primary tool we use here is a thermometer. There are various different types of thermometers, but all measuring the amount of kinetic energy. And the last one I'm just going to give you today is density. And this one is different. When we look at the first six that I gave you, these are all what we would consider to be uh, base units. Okay. 
Uh, maybe not weight. Weight is a derived unit as well. And we'll talk more about what a derived unit is as we get into our next unit. Uh, but here, density equals mass over volume. You see a base unit being the gram per milliliter, gram per cubic centimeter, or the kilogram per cubic meter. These are all acceptable density measures, depending on what the inputs are, because you have that math equation of mass over volume, which is going to give you a derived unit, not a base unit. Okay. So objects float if their density is less than the density of the fluid that they are in, whether that fluid is air, whether that fluid is a liquid. Um, so we just have to think about the relationships. Again, D equals MV is a mathematical relationship that expresses the relationship between the parts and how we determine density. Okay. Next is the idea of scientific experimentation. Today, after you've collected your materials from school, hopefully your lab kit, um, we're hoping to go ahead and get started on uh, the Whirlybird lab, okay? What we're looking at is what we call a controlled test. We're, we're trying to isolate how small changes to a particular set of circumstances can cause changes in the outcome of what it is that we're testing. You should only change one variable at a time. Okay, there are two variables that we identify, what's known as the manipulated or independent variable, and this is the one that we are changing. What we're measuring on the other end is what's known as the responding or dependent variable. This is the effect of the change we made in the manipulated or independent variable. Now, everything else is what we would consider to be a constant and does not change from one experiment to the next. So controlled variables are those which you could change, but you're not allowing to so that you can see the impact of your manipulated variable on your responding variable. There are two parts to an experiment. If you expand to more large scale experiments, these are the control group, which is under what we would consider to be the normal conditions. And you're going to compare those outcomes to the experimental group where we have changed the variables. Because ultimately, if you remember COMPT from last class, C-O-N-P-T-T, -T, that P is predictable. Science as a tool is only really valuable if we can use it to predict the outcome of the changes, okay? And that is the ultimate goal of any experiment. Now, if we were in class, we would spend more time on this. We really wanna make sure that you guys stay safe I'm not there looking over you to kind of help keep you safe, but make sure that you're following instructions and not going off, going rogue on your experiments, okay? Um, I don't want you to hurt yourself or anybody else. And as we go ahead and continue to move forward, there is, however small, a potential for you to hurt yourself. So just be careful moving forward, okay? These are the symbols that we typically use for lab safety. Um, as we are not in class, most of these are not going to apply. Um, when we go ahead and take a look at this, I may use some videos, but you're not subjected to the safety concerns that I may be if I can get time to go ahead and do it. But when we go ahead and cut things, you just don't wanna cut yourself if you heat things up in the microwave or for any of our experiments, you don't wanna deal with burns, anything like that. So just be careful, all right? And so we've talked a lot about science as a tool, but there's another really powerful tool that I really want you to capitalize on, and that is your brain. It's probably the best tool at your disposal. And so I hope you'll take the time to really empower your brain and to use it to effectively apply the knowledge that you gain in this course to the world around you. Okay, so that's really it for the notes. The next thing I want to go over is what's known as dimensional analysis. You may also have heard about it as factor labeling. Um, I wanna do a couple of practice problems and give you a chance to go ahead and try your hand at these to make sure you know how to do it. Now, when you do it, I'm gonna give you some unit conversions here, but I really want you to go ahead and practice writing everything out longhand. I would actually prefer it if you were to go ahead and either use your lab notebook you picked up at Willamette today or some other lined notebook to go ahead and write out your problems here. Then take a picture of that and submit that for your responses rather than doing it digitally. Okay, 
I want you to get in the practice of writing out every single unit and canceling them. One of the biggest mistakes even my best students have made is that they tend to rush because they think it's easy and they end up messing up their units. Okay, so be methodical, be slow, be detailed, make sure you write everything out and cross it out. Okay, that's going to be the most successful thing for you. So here is our list of practice problems. And I will go ahead and attach these so that you can get some practice doing this. Um, but ultimately, what you're really working on here is understanding how we get from one thing to another. Okay, I will try and go ahead and write out an example. And if you have any troubles to this, please come to office hours. Remember, they are from 12 to 1.30 using the need help link. And I can go ahead and go over that with you so that you can see this. It's much easier to go ahead and do in person. Okay. All right. So how many miles will a person run during a 10 kilometer race? We need to be able to convert kilometers two miles. Now you could, yes, look up the actual conversion factor and do it in a single step. And in the end, that's fine. Okay. But ultimately, maybe we go ahead and know a conversion that we can go ahead and use uh, that allows us to go ahead and do this. Okay. So for what we're doing, you can go ahead and use the conversion of 0.621 miles is equal to one kilometer. If you go ahead and start with your 10 kilometers on top, Draw a line under it, <clears throat> put a dot next to it, then draw another line next to that. Now, since we're doing canceling here, kilometers on top means you have to have kilometers on bottom. So we're going to use this conversion factor with 0 0 0.621 miles on the bottom and one kilometer on the top. That way, when we do this, uh, oops, I have that upside down. See, this is why you have to write it out. Um, one kilometer on the bottom and 0.621 miles on the top. That way kilometers on bottom crosses out with kilometers on top and we're left with the unit of the mile, okay? So that should be pretty easy to go ahead and do. 10 times 0.621 gives us 6.21 miles for a 10 kilometer race, okay? All right, so try the rest of your hand at these. I'd be happy to go over any of them with you and um, then we can go ahead and talk about it again on Thursday. All right, thanks guys. Have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Take care.